Welcome to another edition of the Hawk Off the Press podcast. I'm your host, Gazette Hawkeyes reporter, John Steppi. I am excited to be joined by Jess Settles, college basketball analyst, former Iowa basketball player under Dr. Tom Davis, and a farmer too, in case the whole college basketball analyst stuff doesn't keep him busy enough. Jess, thanks for joining me. Hey, I appreciate being on, and uh, I'm out here in Fort Collins, Colorado. I'm calling a Colorado State, San Diego State game tonight, which will be a monster game, but it's just pouring down snow. (laughs) They've canceled classes, but, you know, out here they're used (laughs) to it, so they're getting it moved around, but the skiers love it, but those of us who have to maneuver around this, it's kind of tough, but uh, old Jay Norvell is the coach here at Colorado State, and your Hawkeye fans will remember his great career in the early 80s and and all that he's accomplished in football. But it's uh, it's definitely definitely snowy and, and a different uh, weather pattern here than it is back home in Iowa. Can you just take a snowmobile to the arena? <laughs> right. right. <laughs> it's, I mean, I'm looking out the window right now, and I mean, it's – I'm going to guess there's at least six inches on the ground. I'm, I'm going to say at least. So it's wow. – it's, It's bad. Yeah. Well, in not as as I look out my window and see zero inches of snow in Iowa City, it's been a pretty good stretch here for Iowa basketball, four straight wins against four quality opponents. What's really stood out to you about this recent string of success after not so great stretch before that? Well, it's it's really been Peyton Sanford, right? That that's been the biggest difference. If you just want to pick one guy out and say, you know, earlier in the year he just could not buy a basket, uh, rimming them out, a uh, little off on his shot, his follow through, his rotation, he just was not there. And and that you get shots in Fran McCaffrey's offense. If you move the ball the way they do, you're you're going to get those looks. And uh, he just could not punish the defense for helping off. Then. You know, you get the huge win against Indiana, the major comeback. Those are those are so exciting. And the, the biggest win going to Rutgers. No one wins there. I mean, you it wouldn't surprise me if they have maybe two losses on the year out there. And for Iowa to go in there and lead from the opening tip all the way to the end was something that never happens. I, I think I was reading in the game notes the other day, I was calling a Rutgers game. I, I think it's the first time in five years that a team went into the rack and led from start to finish. I mean, you just, you think about that. And Sanford was brilliant. Those guys were still talking about it. He hit huge shots. So that to me has been the biggest difference. And uh, obviously Rebrach has been playing well over the last month. Um, Murray is uh, quietly, right? He's such a quiet kid, but just those isolations against Maryland late in the game where he just can't be stopped. They're playing better basketball. Uh, They're, they're winning um, miraculously. Obviously, the Michigan game was incredible, the four-point play. But the I think the, the simple answer is Peyton Sanford is playing great. Is there something specifically that you can point out to that he's doing differently to get these to start going in? Or is it just a matter of, okay, that's how basketball works. Sometimes you've got your shot and sometimes you don't. Yeah, I, I think it's fair to say that most shooting guards, pure shooting guards, are are uh, are fragile, because you know when I was playing, and uh, if you, I could go in and get four or five rebounds, and maybe dive on the floor and get the crowd into it, or pick up a couple fouls and get free throws. So even on the nights when I felt like I wasn't playing well or let the guys down, I could still look at the stat sheet and say, hey, you know. Five, six points, four or five ribs still contributed. Well, as a as a shooting guard, for most nights, it's you're either knocking in perimeter jumpers or you're not. And there's really no mercy. You can't, it's not high school, you can get two steals and get out and get a couple dunks or pad your stats. It's it's just, hey, you're you're one for ten or two for ten or seven for ten, and it and it's really an emotional roller coaster. I don't quite understand the life of a shooting guard, and I'm glad that I wasn't one. But uh, I think for him, it's just what they're going to throw all kinds of things, uh, more confidence, better looks, but all these. But I don't know if down deep there's any explanation for it other than you see a couple go in and, and you change a few things and 
I know fundamentally he he works hard on his game with his dad and with the coaching staff. And uh, he, I, it looked like his follow through was a little off a few weeks ago, and I haven't studied it lately. But he, obviously, something's changed. And then with this Big Ten, you have Purdue at the top as kind of the standard bearer this season. But it seems like after that, there are a lot of quality teams and not a ton of difference between them. Do you see that as an opportunity if Iowa can keep up this play that they've had the last few weeks here for the next month and a half here of the season? Absolutely, right? I mean, you look at every game and you say they're not a – uh, these Iowa kids won't be afraid of anybody. They're not afraid of Purdue either. But that's that's obviously a major mismatch on paper. But the Iowa press has given Purdue fits the last couple of years. And don't forget about the championship game last year at the Big Ten tournament when you know that was one of the best games a uh, Hawkeye team's ever played. Uh, that was just amazing. So they're not afraid of those guys, but – you look at you look at Edie and the dominance that he plays with and his height and his size, that's going to be tough. But everybody else, on any given night, anybody can win. Northwestern's got a heck of a ball team. I mean, it's – it's yeah, I, I think this t- Iowa team, Connor is a veteran. He's been around. He pours into the young guys. They're, they're champions. They already have their hardware. They've already accomplished a tremendous amount wearing the black and gold. But these are great opportunities. And, and, and you look at their resume right now. I don't have it in front of me. But the win at Rutgers is incredible. And then you've got a quality win over Indiana, a quality win against Michigan. And didn't we beat Clemson earlier in the year? Yeah, that feels like yeah. ages ago, but that was this It does, year. right? It didn't seem like a big deal at the time. I, I believe as of a couple of days ago, Clemson was in first place in the ACC. Now, I think, I think uh, Wake Forest might have defeated them last night. Uh, I've been jumping around time zones here, so I'm, I haven't been studying very much. But I, I, I like I like our resume, and I think I've already. Oh, the you know what the big the big one is the the massacre of Iowa State. Yeah, that's the big one. Iowa State is is rolling right now. So I, you take away the Eastern Illinois loss, you take away some of the struggles. Didn't didn't Rabracha didn't play tough enough against the Duke against Duke and he he regrets that and ever since then he's just been a man but you take away just a couple of those little hiccups guys are healthier now I'm excited for him I don't know what what you're seeing but I'm really excited that was a phenomenal last three or four games of basketball how much of do you how much do you think this is a sustainable thing or is this kind of just an up and down wave kind of nature of college basketball like how it often is well, I think it's sustainable. Uh, I think they're going to be in every game. They they score so well, and but it's it's a it's a real meat grinder. The Big Ten, it, they're really. I mean, you say there aren't any nights off, and there really aren't. It, it's it's just so tough from top to bottom. And if you don't play well and you don't shoot it well, you're going to lose. There's there's just a lot ahead of them. But it, it felt like with the injuries, um, with Patrick stepping down with Sanford not playing well, it felt like 10 days ago that it was kind of season on the brink as far as those guys reaching their goals. Um, you got Indiana coming in and they're, they're healthy. They've had, they've had, uh, they're not healthy to fresh. They've had two weeks to prepare. Uh, the, you, know, you fall down by 20 and you come back and win that. I mean, if you lose that one, then it's hard to get your momentum going into Rutgers. Uh, and then the Michigan game that didn't play their best, but, yeah, I'm I'm very I'm very optimistic and yet it's not a league where you can make very bold predictions because it can just turn so quickly. But if they if they stay healthy, um I'm pretty excited and, and enjoy watch them play. And then on a family note, for people who aren't aware, Jess is first cousins with 49ers tight end and former Hawkeye George Kittle. What's it been like seeing George go through Another successful season, career high in touchdown receptions, and a playoff run here too. Yeah, it's it's the whole the entire ordeal is surreal, right? From the time he got into the league to becoming one of the stars of the NFL, right? It's it's uh it's it's been remarkable. I uh, I I felt strongly that uh, Henry Craiger Colbel, my other cousin, who was on the Rose Bowl team with George. Uh, I, I felt like both of those guys would have good NFL careers that they would stick around. I, they're so strong. They, they've got world-class hands, you know, from, I, from the time they 
sat on my knee and we played baseball in the backyard and, and all that stuff. They, they always, both of them had really good hands and Henry was always more physical and, and tougher. And George was just lanky and, you know, thin and bouncy. And, and he was a more of a late bloomer. Um, I, I know my, probably my wife, Joanna, who's coached a lot over her lifetime. She was probably the one person who was just very confident that George would, could be a star. She thought he could be an all pro level guy because he's got speed but I don't think any of the rest of us, I, and even even my uncle Bruce and Jan, they're like, you know, the nut, you're just trying to make it. You're just trying to stay, survive it, and collect the checks, and just stay in the league two or three years and all that. But for him to then go and just be the most valuable part of that team and his blocking and uh, now another year of just dominance and then have Purdy come out of Iowa State and those two to have that chemistry. I mean, this thing is – it's just blowing up like, like nothing. I, I can't believe it. And it's, it's so exciting. And uh, I, I, it's awesome. Right. I'm so happy for those guys. And Henry, Henry played in the league for a couple of years and, uh, and just couldn't catch a break and he's not there anymore, but uh, it's, it's right. What are the odds of making it, let alone being a star all pro guy? It's, 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 it's awesome. And this must be a lot of fun, too, for now your 100-year-old grandma who is able to see her first 49ers game. Yeah. So, you know, long story sort of short, my grandpa, Bruce and Bub Crager, was a great football player out of Mount Union, Iowa, which is south of Iowa City, about 45 miles. And uh, he he signed on to play at the University of Iowa. But this was a different era, and uh, he got homesick. And he had never been off the farm and he'd never been away from his people. And and it, he didn't last there but a few weeks. And I, I remember, I think my grandma told me that his job was working in the kitchen at one of the dorms and he and he couldn't take it. And he was just, he had to get home. And so he goes home and uh, and then becomes an All-American at Iowa Wesleyan University um, and had a great career. And, and I said his name is Bruce and Bub because he was like Henry and George. He's just a, just a really tough physical guy. And then after I was and he got drafted by a team, they were called at the time, the, I believe the Chicago Cardinals. So professionally, but again, he, he turned it down and we're, we're talking, you know, pennies uh, to go get just slaughtered. Right. But he wanted to farm. He wanted to raise a family. So he, my grandma, Lucky Craiger and my grandpa, Bob, they raised 10 daughters. They, they had 10 daughters and no sons. And so, and, and all of them were really good players. All of them were great athletes and they, they were very, they had successful careers. It was six on six basketball and softball and went to the state tournament and they were all very good, but they were a little bit ahead of their time. I don't even think they had volleyball. That would have been their best sport. They were tall and powerful and athletic, but so to go through that and then the grandsons and the granddaughters came along. And so I was fortunate enough to play at Iowa. My Aunt Amy played softball, was a walk-on at Iowa. You know, George and Henry playing at Iowa. Uh, my cousin Brad Carlson I, is either the all-time freshman home run leader or maybe still career leader at, at, for baseball at Iowa. Um, my cousin Lou uh, was on the row team. I, I just had another, it would be my second cousin, just I think verbally committed for soccer at the University of Iowa. So to – to, to have my grandma, Craiger, turn 100 and then and to have George be in a position to fly her with some of my aunts on a private jet from Iowa City to San Francisco. And then, you know, she's in a box. She's in a suite. Um, and the whole stadium sings happy birthday to her. And then to have him score, I believe, two touchdowns and then salute her. You know, it, it's almost kind of a movie and it's full circle for a very – godly and Christ-like woman who is very humble, not materialistic. Uh, I tell people her house looks the same as it did 30 years ago, lived on the same piece of dirt like so many Iowans have uh, in Southeast Iowa, not just has enjoyed thousands of games of sports, but obviously, you know, that whole, that ordeal is a whole nother level than what any of us would be used to or expect. So that was a phenomenal, uh, event for her and and we all we all had a blast watching it wow that has to be like the talk of southeast iowa now <laughs> you know turning 100 having the whole stadium i saw the video of the happy birthday and 
Like you just don't see that very often anywhere. No, it's, it's, it's two different worlds, right? It's, it's, it's not the life that we grew up with. It's not what we'd expect. It's, you know, you're, you're humble and you, you know, all your neighbors and it's not, it's not Hollywood at all. Right. It's just, it's what connects us as I ones. And uh, we're thankful for what we have. And, but yeah, so, I mean, yeah, it, it's not, uh, it's not anything we expected. We couldn't believe it. I, I talked to her for about a half an hour to my grandma and, and my aunt Amy. My grandma still lives at the farm, by the way. And my aunt Amy lives with her. So and that's been great. And I tell people in the spring, she'll be out gardening. And, and uh, I, I see her a lot uh, when I'm farming. We, you know, I farm her ground for her at the house there. But I talked to her for half an hour and she's as sharp as she's ever been. Uh, the, she's still as funny as she's ever been. She's got incredible uh, personality, sense of humor. Um, you know, she was telling stories about when she and my grandpa, when they first got married, which let's just say they were in their young twenties, uh, you know, going to the old field house and, and they love to drive up the old field house together and watch Iowa play basketball. So you, you're talking about just a generational Hawkeye and, uh, yeah, it's, she had, she told me on the phone two days before she had, I, I, I'm close on this. I, I think she had 90 birthday cards showed up the day before her birthday and then on her birthday she had 45 and i i'm guessing since she's gotten home i'm guessing there'll be at least another hundred there so uh, i know dr tom and sherry davis sent her a card and people from around the country that she's crossed paths with over the years she's a very she she's a very neat lady and i you know hopefully I, my, my, her sister, Aunt Janet, I think is 102 or 103 and she's still living and doing well. And then my, uh, we call her my aunt Wilma, who was my grandma's best friend and neighbors for all those years. Um, my, my grandpa, Bub's sister, I think she lived to be 103 in Mount Pleasant and, and, uh, was, I mean, so there, there's, uh, there's some genetics in there that, uh, most of us <laughs> can't relate to. <laughs> I was going to say, what's in the water there? Man, I know, you know, just, uh, I, 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 people will ask me that. And I, my, my grandma, I mean, she loves her kids. She loved her husband. She just was, my grandpa and grandma were best friends. I, I think my, I, I think my grandma, before COVID, my grandma lucky told me that she had missed five, uh, church services in her life total. So this is before COVID. So they, they were really, she was really founded and still is in the word of God. She loves the Lord. She loves the word. Um, and, and so it's just being on the farm. She's, she's really thrived. And, and, uh, that's, that's obviously not the formula for, for you, you never know. Right. But it, for her, she would tell you that God's been really good to her and she's very thankful for it. I'm sure she'd love to see maybe a George Kittle Super Bowl appearance in a few weeks. Oh man, man, come on, right? Come on. <laughs> they we we had it, right? Was it three years ago, four years ago? And we what I think it was like third and something. We could, you know, we couldn't get that couple yards, and I think it would have sealed the deal. So I don't man, they have such a good team now with McCaffrey with the way Purdy's playing, but it's it's probably a toss up every game. But yeah, <laughs> if it, it, it that that life that career as a tight end who plays as violently as George does, like it's a small window. It's just, he, he refuses to go out of bounds. He refuses to not try to bull, bull rush somebody. It's the odds of him getting hurt are so high. So is this our last chance? Probably not. If they can, uh, you know, they, they've got such a good team, but a couple injuries derail everything and then it's over. So yeah, man, we're all in, right? Come on. I, my, my wife and girls, are wearing the 49er jerseys to school next week, and maybe that'll bring him some good luck. Is it weird for you as a Hawkeye through and through to see George catching all of these passes from a Cyclone alum? Not really. Um, not really. It's <laughs> it, it. I just, I'm just so glad that he's passing it to George. So I, I'm always like, you know, as a biased homer fan like all of us are right i'm always like why aren't you throwing it to the tight end moron right like, like, what, you know, <laughs> we have the right to scream at the tv so he's like purdy's like man i really love this kid i mean this is this is great i mean i 
I feel bad for him that he had to wear that cyclone uniform, but look, you know, that's <laughs> we can't all be Hawkeyes. I mean, that's just how it is. <laughs> and then on a more somber note, with this being the 30th anniversary this week of Chris Street's passing. What are some of your favorite memories of Chris that stand out three decades later? I loved his passion. I loved his intensity. He was a guy that would speak his mind and in the right way. He'd challenge you. Um, he signed very early. He always wanted to be a Hawkeye. I, I believe he was the second soonest. It's common now, right, to commit in eighth and ninth grade. But back then, I think only Damon Bailey um signed with Bob Knight at Indiana in eighth grade. And I think Chris was the second youngest to ever do that. So people got to know him. Um, there, there was a stigma back then that Iowa kids couldn't play. And uh, they, you know, were there to fill a scholarship, raise the academic levels. It, it was just there. And he really kind of broke that curse for the rest of us. He was able to fight through that, have a good career. Um, uh, I remember going to the, uh, the mall, the old Capitol Mall in Iowa City, and uh, he worked at the shoe, st- shoe store there. And I remember him buying a pair of his shoes that he worked in just so I could kind of be like him. I remember riding around campus with him during the recruiting process and him answering all these questions and making things clear to me and uh, gotten to know Mike and Patty like so many people have over the years. It's been wonderful. But uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really tough and, and sad day. Everybody who's watched the documentary, I have not. I wanted to wait and, and watch it with all the Iowa fans just so I could connect with that. But everybody who's watched it said it's really heavy. It's very sad. Um, um, and it's still very raw 30 years later. So it's it it's a bittersweet night, right? It's going to be fun to see the memories and the guys when they were younger. But obviously, it's, it's, a, it's only because of the tragedy that we all experienced. What's it going to be like when you're watching that documentary? Man. That's a good question, buddy. Um, I will tell you that I I wasn't going to watch it. I I just I didn't I could hardly take it. You know, I wasn't going to watch it. And then a couple about ten days ago, right, the trailer came out, and uh, when I saw Paul Lusk, Chris's old buddy, and I saw our old coach Gary Close. Um, on it I saw those guys break down and then obviously I've seen the trailer myself breaking down it kind of freed me up so to speak I it kind of something broke in me and I I felt like okay it's okay um and I'm I'll, I'm gonna watch it now uh, and I, I would have eventually watched it but I just didn't know if I wanted to watch it that night but that that really said me I I don't I I, I was interviewed out at, at the at West Branch at the golf course out there at the country club um, out on the deck and I wasn't quite prepared for the whole situation the day before I had been at the Chris Street golf tournament and some odd reason I didn't get a chance to connect with Mike and Patty there was just a lot of people around them by the time we were ready to talk either I, I think they had slipped out the back door so being around the guys it's uh, you know it's always good to see everybody but it's always again it's it's heavy and then I, the very next day that I had to go be interviewed and I, I called Coach Close, um, who will be in the – I'm sure will be in it a lot, the documentary. I, I called him just to get my timelines right. And I'm like, listen, okay, what year was this? What year was that? Just so it was it, – it all – I've got a pretty good memory, but it all starts to blend sometimes the months and the seasons. And you don't want to – you don't want to accidentally say it wrong. And, and so I – so then I start talking to him and, you know, so then it get, get, it gets a little tougher, and then and then I go sit down, and as you'll see from the documentary, I you basically you sit down, and and uh, Matt Angle, who did it, did a wonderful job uh, interviewing throughout the process, and and he starts asking me questions about wearing the Iowa uniform and and just simple things like that to break the ice, and I just I I just start tearing up from that part, and he, I don't even I don't even think that he asked me anything about Chris. And I'm not even, and I'm just, you know, I, I can hardly even do it. And so that's how, and I, I think I asked him partway through, or maybe after I said it, what, what was, was it like this for everybody else? And, and he said, most, for most people, it was like that. Like most guys couldn't make it through it without just, and, and then he said something to the effect of the, the stories 
from around the country of coaches and former players and media. They're they're so powerful, and many of them that I'd never heard of, that he was going to request two or three hours for the documentary instead of one. That there was so much good, raw emotion, great stories. And so it looks like it only became one hour. So you know there's there are just hours and hours of good stuff as you as a media member, you know, some most times, you know, shorter is better and you can't put everything in. Um, but so I called Coach Close again right after that. I'm like, I I couldn't even make it through. I, I need a I couldn't even find a box of Kleenexes and I'm it, it just hit me so hard. And uh and he said, well, you're not alone. It's the, that's it's what I went through as well. And unfortunately, John Streif was not a part of it. And he was, you know, outside of Mike and Patty and Coach Davis, he, he was probably the biggest part of it, um, the story, the former Iowa trainer. But he he chose not to be a part of it. And a few guys did as well. And I don't and I don't blame him at all. Um, it, it was really tough. And I, I probably am glad that I didn't quite have a feel for it going in, or I'm not sure I would have wanted to go through it again either. So I, I share those because that's my mentality going into tonight. And last thing on it, I, I'm calling the Colorado state, San Diego state here tonight. I'm assuming the game will still be played. And so I won't even be able to watch it with everybody. I'll probably watch it in the next couple of days. Um, that's my, that's my thought anyway. And, uh, I'm not, but I know every, it'll connect us all as I ones and uh, we'll all remember where we were and what it, it felt like. And, and I think uh, as I'm rambling on here, I, uh, I, one of the big things that came out of it for me being there back in the day, I, you know, you, you lose a child and it's something that no one could process or understand other than people who've been through it. And, um, and it, it really made people reevaluate their relationship with their kids. Uh, am I, am I the father that Mike, Mike was, um, have I reached out to my kids? Have I poured into my sons and daughters the way I should have as a dad, as a mom? Um, I, I really think that that it's, it's, uh, it's nothing you can quantify, but I, I really think that that made a huge difference. I, I look at coach Davis and Keno's relationship I know Coach Davis was a changed man because of it. He poured into Keno. Gary Close, his son Sam, is a manager for Coach McCaffrey. I know that he's an incredible dad. Kenny Murray, Chris Street's best friend, and you obviously look at Chris and Keegan. You know, just incredible quality family time. And it goes on and on and on. And I, I think that's one of the things that maybe came out of it, that you reevaluate that. And, and obviously – Chris was a believer. He was a Christian. He, he, he trusted in Christ for his salvation. And he, he was trusting and believing in the righteousness of Christ. And, you know, as believers, that's, that's the hope that we hold on to so that we can see him again. And so that, you know, those, you have these superficial relationships and these level one relationships that you have as teammates and coaches. After that, man, it was just, these were deep level conversations that we never would have had and guys just sharing uh, their heart with people and praying together and all those things as men that, you know, we're sometimes afraid to do, but that, that, that really helped us connect and become more like brothers. And I'll get, you know, I'll get all kinds of texts today from former teammates and stuff because we're connected through this. And um, yeah, it's, it's going to be tough, buddy. Well, Jess, thanks for making the time, especially on the day of covering a game and with all these other things happening. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It was fun and uh, great job. I appreciate you doing it. Thank you. And thanks to our listeners for tuning into another episode until next week. We will talk Hawks later. Mm-hmm.